Everyone, make sure to watch the prologue to this huge theory first, and then the big first section of evidence. You are basically on part three right now. Technically, it's part two, section two, but for the sake of the algorithm, I'm going to call it part three. I will link parts one and two above now as a playlist that I've made. For those who are prepared, it's time for season four of All Hail King Julian. We are halfway through the show. Mort starts off the premiere by getting his own TV show called Still Life with Feet, where he mimics Bob Ross and draws Julian's feet. He also, of course, wears the blonde wig again and actually shows us another wig he's woven out of the stolen hair he mentioned from before. Clearly this is something all of the personalities enjoy doing. More people mock Maurice until he runs away bawling, I have feelings! Mort fears that Julian can somehow hear his thoughts and he panics, worried they will betray him. We're getting close to some answers, I, I can just feel it. A couple of characters rob the kingdom, and during it, they have an odd conversation about friendly, non-weird wrestling. When they're arrested, they get put in a prison cell where Mort also resides, and he says the crazy line, Orange is the new you. Wanna wrestle? As long as it's weird. Creepy as hell. Another persona. You see, this show is crazier than even the worst SpongeBob, and yet it has incredible consistency. I've said it before. This makes it truly disturbed. It's a show that pretends to be a kid's show, and that's what makes it so eerie. But it actually is a kid's show, so it's very unsettling. Mort finally describes his inner imagination world in episode 2 when he says nobody ever gets hurt there, most of the time. I want to see this world, Mort. Later, everyone puts on a massive act and he plays the bad guy. He relishes in this and darkly chuckles with glee. Another persona? He gets a little too into it and lowers them all into a volcano while laughing like a maniac. Later, it is implied that he is faking it, though. In episode 3, he once again shows his artistic ability when he paints a phenomenal image of Julian. And Julian, of course, calls him a vulgar little mutant. Mort asks, When's lunch? I haven't eaten in like a month. Ah, a self-sustaining system, perpetuating the Lovecraftian take yet further. He claims he's real good at smearing stuff, and that he has parties with organic mannequins of his friends. What Mort has is an obsession with Julian. It sure ain't love, and I don't know if I'd necessarily call it fetishization either. It's an obsession. He has another internal discussion with a personality. This time, it seems to be his inner artist. Our Mort loves the feet, the artsy one does not. Important distinction. Everyone stares at him in creeped confusion. I can't tell if the personality is coercing Mort or taking over Mort. It rotates. Lots more social commentary and sophisticated critique of the avant-garde. He eats fruits whole, but that's all pretty normal, of course, for this show. In the corner, we once again see his home planet painting. Funny, I was just about to say his obsession was alien and fueled by a desire to return to his home constellation. His goal in this episode was to paint Julian the way he truly sees him. His house is full of foot art, and he wants to mount the real deal eventually. Julian finally grants Mort foot access, and Mort screams, I love you! the feet! He throws his face and tongue all over them. See? He butchers grammar and says the feet as if it's an individual entity he's obsessed with, not some sort of usual atypical attraction. He hates other feet in comparison to Julian's, but he'll take what he can get. In episode 4, he has a minutes-long fart. He refuels by breathing in, once again proving him to be a hollow entity in essence. He wishes to be first on the sacrifice list and actively demands danger. He kicks out another sacrifice to take his place and says, I'm first on the list. Read it and weep, gramps. He's talking to Hector, an elderly lemur in the kingdom. I was all like, aren't you older than him, Mort? And Hector literally follows it up with, you're older than me, Mort. See? Usually I have to highlight continuity like this, but here they are, seconds later confirming it for me. Accommodating show. So anyways, they catapult Mort far off the island, and then he suddenly appears right next to them. Changed. So when his altars come into the light, they can teleport him? This rabbit hole is degrading me. Mort says he floats real good because he swapped all his parts for wood years ago. The other character I do want to highlight is the only one I enjoy more than Mort, another supernatural one that can aid in our mission here. That character is Todd. 
He is freaking hilarious. He's this little pageant boy who's always commanded around by that insane Karen soccer mom I mentioned before, Tammy. She's nuts and screams his name, and he always stares blankly into space with the utmost creepiness until called upon by his mother, at which point he does something random but extremely talented. In this episode, he highlights his paranormality when he walks vertically down the side of a chest. Everyone's rightfully scared of him. His mom claims he can be activated. Whatever the hell that means. His default face is brainwashed, though, so I can certainly guess. He has this horrible, evil attack face that looks demonic. And then, in this episode, Tammy finally explains it. She laughs villainously, and no f***ing joke. Claims that they can only stop him by driving a stake through his heart while a priest recites a ritual. Todd is possessed by a demon. She screams at him to let go of Maurice's jugular, and he goes back to Catatonia. He looks like Mort, and is important. This baby lemur is a key to a lock I haven't come across yet. But back to our good pal Mort, who disturbingly locks mannequins inside of his house and drops a boulder on it to put them out of their supposed bizarre misery. He puts on the wig again and plays some drums. Seconds later though, he's back to our Mort, and I can't tell if he's right here hallucinating identities around him or, or what. He spoons sand and then pulls a cannon out of thin air. Dread pirate, I say. People around him don't even question how he apports things anymore. Mort calls Julian handsome, but I know better. It's a twisted obsession. Even when he laughs normally, the subtitles default to calling it evil. Let it be known. Episode 5. Mort twerks on a pole to seduce a rooster. During alleged sensitivity training, Julian calls Mort a fun-sized trash goblin, and Mort loves it. Also calls him a worm-riddled peach pit and a second-hand donkey puppet, which Mort enjoys as well. Carl wants to keep Julian on his toes, to which Mort says, Don't even look at his toes! Julian kicks him, as per the usual. Here, we also get a shot of one of Carl's side hustles, which is freelance religious work. He screams, The power of the sky gods compel you! at Todd, causing him to float in mid-air and then thrash around. Demon child. <sighs> I'm getting exhausted already. I mean, it, it, there's so much. And then a lot of weird shit happens at once. Mort suggests that the Fusa have resorted to cannibalism. Mort implies he likes eating live chicken. Maurice lays an egg. Mort falls into a deep fryer and instantly turns into popcorn, then back again. Episode 6. More Mort Madness. I think he somehow gets onto the mainland and then returns via parachute. A fork stabs him straight through the head, and he asks if something's burning, so clearly Mort has a brain, right? One that can be affected similarly to a human's. He later rolls around in an onion patch to protect from werewolves. There's some unique commentary in this episode on cults, and Mort gets hypnotized into being the evil cat of an evil, sophisticated crocodile who tries to usurp the kingdom. The show gets very, very, very weird. Mort then meows like the supposed cat he is. Probably genetic. I doubt it, but we shall see. Mort turns his head 180 degrees. Is he part owl? I doubt it, but again, we shall see. And it persists here as season 4 is pure insanity. Episode 7. Mort claims nobody ever asks about him unless he's under investigation. Based on his track record, it's certainly clear he's malicious indeed. Multiple arrests are quite likely in his past. Mort is asked if his family has had inbreeding, and he says he's his own grandfather. We soon learn that his dad was a bear, and from what I understand, we eventually meet Grammy Mort's husband, so clearly someone is lying somewhere. Does this inbreeding mean Mort has time traveled? We're in very close proximity to the bombshell episode, yes, but I don't know. Next up, Mort swims in a tub of toenails and squeals, Give it to me! as he fills his mouth with them. Tammy starts speaking in various extinct tongues when she presumes someone around her is possessed by a demon. She has clear experience with Todd. Mort then counters the notion that he breathes through his mouth when he dives in a pool and claims his gills are clogged with drain hair. This means he is also part fish. Mort panics and needs to consult his inner voices. One of them calls him Mortimer and tells him not to blow it. 
This new name counters when he called himself Mordecai, and brings up the possibility that he just adds stuff onto his name quite randomly. But his original name is just Mort, which, as I've said many times before, is Latin for death. Several more Morts show up in his mind and show that they've got a whole system in this psychotic inner world. They're starting to truly build on Mort's lore, finally. He gets married to Pam, a woman who tries stealing the throne. They accuse Mort of being a completely unknown species, to which he replies he's fully aware that he's a medical marvel whose father was a bear. So much is going on now, it's madness, and they're revealing things about his genealogy. Remember Sage? Yeah, his huge bird comes crashing into a rock and he heals it with magical tears. His last name is Moondancer. He has got to have Sky God relations somehow. Maurice claims to be surrounded by crazy people, and that is very sadly true. Turns out Pam illegally married Mort and is a con artist. Turns out she also married that zombie who then reconnects with Mort and goes on a cruise. Mort, all done up in his usual blonde wig. It can't get any crazier, but I positively know it will. Episode 8. Mort is leaking something. Later says he bursts an artery as well. Also raises his eyebrows, winks, and says he'll take some fine tunage if we know what he's saying. <laughs> Hmm. Pop culture commentary abounds in this episode. Mort thrusts the air, zero exaggeration. Then he roasts someone and later says, Oh, I can handle this. Happy to do it, in fact. He nefariously chuckles. Another persona? I'm losing it. There's so much. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I just can't. What? So you're telling me... No. No, 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 no. We focus on Mort and the supernatural that surrounds him. Now is not the time for Puss in Boots. Shrek may tie in later, but for now, this makes no sense. Moving on. Episode 9, he's electrocuted, showing he does have a skeleton once again. It is implied that Mort helped brainwash some of the citizens, but finally, we've made it to the episode where everything, everything that they've ever built up unravels. The beginning of not just this show's madness, but what it does from now on, which is sci-fi madness. Absolute pure insanity and why I'm making the theory. Season 4, episode 10. You seriously all have to watch this one for yourselves. They don't even stall the inevitable that is this episode. Julian has that science dude, Timo, build a cloning machine so that he can love more of himself. He does, and various Julians of different personalities come strutting through. Lastly, a female Julian pops out, and Julian falls in love, making Mort jealous. Mort loves her feet too, though, and thus he finally loses it and takes it upon himself to activate the machine again with his butt. He wants his very own Julian to, quote, cuddle, bathe, and feed while he's strapped to a high chair. The machine takes his signature instead of Julian's and reaches into another universe populated entirely by evil Mort clones. Turns out Timo somehow accidentally built an interdimensional portal and merely has let through alternate versions of Julian. In the Mort universe, there's thousands of them, who all bow and pray to their leader, Mordecus Khan, who sits on a giant throne of skulls in the middle of a barren wasteland filled with foot effigies. To those who thought I was joking, I have just stumbled upon the largest untapped gold mine in the known history of fan theorizing. They all march right through the portal, and Mort screams that his nightmares have come to annihilate him. I assume he could detect their existence through the fabric of reality? Or his memories? I don't know. Every single Mort in Mordecus Khan's army seems to have the abilities of our regular Mort, and they begin destroying Madagascar while chanting, Mort, 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 Mort? Mort, 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 Mort? Their war horns are gigantic woodwinds that are not blown into with the mouth, but with the Anus. They have endlessly long farts that announce their presence. Mordecus himself shows what a mort is truly capable of when he claims to smell the fear of other lemurs as he conquers this universe. He claims to be supreme leader of the Mortverse, which to me either means the multiverse in relation to the mort residing in each one, or it's just the name he gives his own barren universe. 
Perhaps his horde consists of every other Mort in every other universe he has conquered? Anyways, the gang tracks down Mort and forces him to down coffee so Smart Mort will return. Once he does, things come full circle. Smart Mort claims he has a friend who can explain the multiverse. And we cut to none other than Pineapple in his limbo, communicating with those on the ground. How does Smart Mort know Pineapple? How? How on earth? Is this thing even Julian's ancestors? Who knows? Smart Mort has seen it all. Pineapple then calls in Dr. Watermelon Balking to explain the multiverse, utterly obliterating the fourth wall in the process by speaking directly to the quote, kids at home. Pineapple says he owes a lot of money to fruits and veggies of other universes. At this point, I feel like Pineapple is sort of the god or a god of our universe, interpreted the only way the characters know how. Smart Mort refers to regular Mort as himself once again. Normal Mort calls Smart Mort icky. So is he a persona or just Mort? Answer me, show, damn it! Smart Mort knows so much. He's got all the knowledge of Mort's immortal life an anomalous elder god trapped as a mouse lemur in the corner of a forgotten island off the coast of Mozambique. Holy hell. He says every mort in every universe loves the feet, and he gets distracted back into normal mort, forcing them to coffee him again. Mordecus says that no universe has ever dared face him. They chant their anthem, Mort, 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 we come to fight, we come to kill, today you die, you surely will. They vow to leave no survivors and dine on the tears of the dead. The clouds open up and reveal Limbo as the divine fruits watch down on the ensuing massacre. They pump up a massive balloon of a lemur foot and it entrances the Mort Horde. They run straight up a cliff face for it. Mordecus ain't so easily swayed, I can see why he's their ruler. On second glance, I do think the barren wasteland is in fact a completely ocean-free version of our world, right outside Madagascar. After all, it's through reality, not through space, and they drop down out of the portal that is elevated on our side. Mordecus nearly cuts off Julian's feet to take as a necklace, but they close the portal in time. Smart Mort returns to the depths of Mort's mind as well, claiming it causes a spatio-temporal imbalance for him to be out. He's multiversal, I know it. Well, that was draining, and we haven't even gotten to the 16-part episode yet. <sighs> and now we do. Episodes 11, 12, and 13 of the fourth season follow a similar plot that culminates in a massive cliffhanger that is resolved in a whopping 13 more individual episodes of the serialized drama known as Exiled. It's basically season four and a half of All Hail King Julian, if such a thing existed, and Netflix has, for some reason, separated it as its individual show, because it's more dramatic and chapter-based. In episode 11, though, Mort says he has an imaginary friend named Nathan, which, let's face it, another persona. Mort says he likes his Julian soggy and alive. He gets struck by lightning through a roof. Mort once again mocks Maurice's crying by saying, Haha, he's not dead inside. This presumes Mort thinks the norm is to be dead inside, i.e. Mort is dead inside. Mort's electrocution now causes him to attract appliances, and a Roomba chases him, to which he yelps, Call an exorcist. So the enormous plot starts right around here, where Sage's brother, Koto, king of the mountain lemurs, comes in and lies about his kingdom being destroyed. It's all a plot to take over the lemur kingdom with his warrior species. Sage is rightfully suspicious. Episode 12. While the mountain lemurs plot and raid, Mort removes all of his organs. Some of them are metallic. Mort then, oh, to my great pleasure, gets a DNA test, and the kingdom's creepy doctor, Dr. S. the Snake, is even terrified and disturbed by the results. The show then plays creepy music as he reads off the results in a very similar fashion to how I did in part one. Mort nods as Dr. S. says Mort's only 40% lemur, but 60% bear, starfish, sand, potbelly pig, cactus, and a spool of copper wire. Mort corrects him and adds on wood chips to which Dr. S acknowledges as well. This is all only to Mort's knowledge there could be more or ones missed on the test. 
Perhaps these are just from the organs he's replaced. Mort beeps when he's nervous. Oh. Julian has a dream of a parallel timeline where he never met Maurice, and in it, Mort claims he made a dream catcher woven from Julian's uncle's fur. Again, Julian's uncle is one of the show's villains constantly trying to reclaim the throne, but we'll get more on him later. Maurice turns out to be an eye eye, a different species of lemur, and apparently this species is known for sacrificing beautiful eye eyes to what they call bell gods at the center of the earth. Sounds a lot like sky gods, but we see these. They're the same ones I briefly mentioned were plotting from before. They are literal bells underground. They have prophecies in a whole society, and they foretell a time of lemur war which is about to come. Season 4 finale. Kodo conquers every Madagascar kingdom and enslaves everyone. Mort tries escaping by acting as if he's a drop-dead hot chick, and their guard is a handsome sailor. He's had some clear experience. He asks Todd not to judge him. Todd stares blankly into space, of course. With Kodo, it ain't personal. Conquest is just business. Julian does a dance-off, but fails from lack of endurance. Everyone calls Mort delusional, as he uses his teeth to drill out of the prison and save Julian. Mort distracts the execution snake via twerking hypnosis. Mort epically enough, is the last line of defense. The snake plays with its new food while Julian escapes on a submarine, starting up exiled. Chapter 1. Kodo wants to quote, make Madagascar great again. Mort is devastated and works like the other captives as an unpaid intern that carries enormous boulders on his back. I swear, Sage is like a parody of wisdom itself, and says his usual quote something like, We are all just kicking the cosmic footy sack with a guy named Skeeter who lives in a van. This is the sort of stagnation everyone else is going through while Mort is taking action. He crawls up on his back like the cat he doesn't know he is, and consults his inner room of personalities once again. They brainstorm on how to kill Koto while acting in various ways and doing various bizarre things. One of them says, Oh, baby, daddy likey. Does this somehow imply Mort has absorbed his father? Thought he was a bear. Or does he just see him as a Mort now? How'd he absorb a bear? Maybe Mort has the unique power to absorb non-Morts, which puts him apart from the likes of the Mort Horde, and has resulted in a genetic soup? I really want a Mort v. Morticus deathmatch. One of the mental Morts says to kill the other lemurs as well, and now we truly do get to see the sorts of evil Mort has rattling around in his soul. He laughs like the villain he is, and everyone is horrified. He's stupid, but he feigns stupidity to an extent as well. He plans to murder Koto straight up. Mort has a lot of hello wicked schemes, but he wily coyotes himself every single time, putting him in a full body cast. They soon later take it off because he regenerates quickly, of course. Koto is amused and makes Mort his jester. Chapter 2. Sage divorces his hawk, who he also raised from birth. Mort's rib punctures his stomach. Koto relishes the job and forces Mort to consecutively smash plates on his own head. He dismisses Mort as ignorant, but we once again zoom into his mind and see his evil personalities claiming they understand everything. The little good and bad voices on Mort's shoulders don't exist, for he has a whole society of differing perspectives that take their own spotlights. They do this constantly in Exiled, and they all try possessing him to no avail. Chapter 3 Todd is eaten by a snake mid-dance routine. Speaking of snakes, Mort slithers like one during an escape attempt. Serpentine ancestor? Wiggles like a slug, too. We learn that the psychic lizards can teleport. During another escape, Mort seduces the same guard with his Hey, sailor! talk and asks for her hand in marriage. His inner voices object to it. With Julian gone, his personas are really active somehow. One of them suggests a prenup. He manages to win the guard's affection by moving her one inch after slamming into her from deflecting off a tree she punched him into. A burglar persona seemingly takes over Mort. We also see a completely different character who actually looks like he has true dissociative identity disorder. Chapter 4. Kodo asks Mort why he constantly giggles evilly as he plots more escape routes. In other news, a fish that barfs mud vomits up a human hand that grants Clover a weapon to save the kingdom. <laughs> more super neutrality. Mort creates a play to distract Kodo during their escape and calls everyone babe. 
Four of his personalities mock and chastise him about his failure of playwriting. He gets a little immersed since he's only used to writing novels, but his play is successful and they all tunnel out. Chapter 5, Sharks Can Talk Underwater. Apparently dolphins in this universe are, quote, villains that sell other sea creatures to Russian oligarchs. This isn't too far-fetched. I remember an evil dolphin from the Penguins show too, but that's for later. Tammy tells little Todd to, quote, inhale mama's wind, baby, as they escape through the tunnel. He is right behind her butt. What? They then use Todd's face to shove her up through the ground. What, what? Kodo finds them. The fez-wearing crocodile ambassador calls Mort a yeti. Genealogical confirmation, Mort gets a couple of Mordecai voices in the corner of his head to aid him, and these two are fluffy, yeti-esque savages, one of which threatens to bite through Kodo's Achilles heel. They escape in a cloud of fart while Tammy sicks Todd on the guards. Then something top-tier shocking occurs. A topic that I've also done rigorous theories on in the past. Mort escapes Kodo by diving into a random glowing wardrobe in the jungle which leads him down a tunnel and out into our world where he is a real mouse lemur in real footage of Madagascarian nature. <sighs> His crazy grandma is there and she says, you've come down the wishing well, stay with us. This is the real you. I can't tell if this is in his mind, or if the wardrobe literally led to this sort of real-world heaven haven. But either way, it's perplexingly cross-dimensional. Unless it's not. You see, I have reason to believe, based on the granny's wording, that this is the real Mort, and the entirety of Madagascar is an elaborate fiction that he's trapped himself in for the sole purpose of self-defense in the real world. It makes sense. Everything radiates into his world. This seems to be implied by this scene, but all this would mean is that Mort is a sort of eldritch god of his own universe. Essentially then, whether this is truly in his mind or not doesn't change a single bit of the stakes and purpose of what's going on in the show. Either Mort is an elder god who built our universe, or he's a Goodman's mouse lemur that is the elder god of his own fictional universe, who hides there in his stories for safekeeping. This is presented as a random offhand joke and I understand why. It's irrelevant, because we already knew Mort was some sort of omnipotent ageless deity. It's most likely that this is just more of his crazy, indescribable, hyperdimensional inner mind, hence his granny also being there. It's a joke meant to confuse theorizing, basically, and I won't be confused by it. He flies back out of the wardrobe and promises to fight to the end. Julian is still trying to get back home, and he meets this enormous emotional tentacle in the depths of a cavern who claims to be an alien from another planet confirming aliens' existence outright. Mort falls for his own traps, but doesn't die, of course. I was all fine and good until another character, Gigi, reveals she has a photo on her wall of another real-life animal. Where do we go from here? It's like Spongebob, where it's sort of just perspective that makes these characters animated? Who knows? I've also theorized the exact opposite. Say this sentence ten times fast to your therapist. The evil dolphins bully the nerdy tentacle alien and threaten to sell him to Russia. You can't make this shit up. Which is why I'm appalled that some DreamWorks and Netflix writers actually managed to do just that. Mort then explains to Gigi that scientists claim he has unclassified pheromones that make no sense and could possibly be alien. Mort outright confirms here that he's a genetic anomaly from outer space who has no memory. This is sadly a huge step. Sadly because of how ridiculous it is, and sadly because it means I can't get the chance to theorize on it as much. It also means Mort is aware of what scientists are and has had time to be studied. The question is, is he referring to when they came and kidnapped him in that other episode, or has he been a wanted anomaly for generations? You know, I was told by you guys a few weeks ago to visit something called the SCP Wiki, because apparently my terminology and theories sound similar whenever I go off on an eldritch entity. I must say, it's a pretty interesting website. Hashtag non-spawn. Everything to do with Mort is intentionally contradictory in an interdimensional sense. Maybe this whole show is just the subdimensional brainchild of its writers. You know, that's probably the single most complicated way I could possibly explain All Hail King Julian being a fictional show. Julian replaces the king shark that the dolphins kidnapped with a warhead, which they sell to... the Russians. 
comedic commentary. This show is truly starting to remind me of Twin Peaks. That Mort dream was mere foreshadowing of Exiled. Chapter 6 of 13. Mort furiously screams at Timo to open the freaking door. <laughs> Apparently Sage was in an alien support group. I swear this show is building to something enormous. Commentary on charlatans, blah 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 blah. Mort is hit with his own cannonball, scorched by a blowtorch, blown up with a volume of TNT I would calculate had I not been in a rush to get this out due to the upload scarcity at the moment. Scarcity is because of this show. I have done nothing else. No worry, I'll be uploading a lot to make up for lost time, because the one thing this show has been good for is ideas. In this episode, Julian finds that Russian space monkey again, and so much here leads me to believe Mason and Phil were also rejected test subjects. Perhaps all the monkeys were, and these ones build a massive blimp similar to the plane in the film series. The other thing that crosses over from this show are the sky gods, which either do work by coincidence when Julian sacrifices the shark in film 2, or don't work at all because they're not on Madagascar, and the gods seem to be localized physical pagan deities. Chapter Chapter 7. Mort gets inside Timo's pod and discovers he's been held hostage by his own security system who gained sentience and has been pretending to be a strict mother. Clover is somehow given a paranormal nightmare from Sage's mentor, warning her to exit the cult she joins and then deprograms. Yes, that has been a crucial plot point, and their seminars look like the Red Room from Twin Peaks. Back to Mort, where this time, Mort's head cranks a whole 360 degrees. Owl I says, that seems to be the limit as he cranks it right back. Chapter 8. They reprogram the robot and it aids Mort and Timo on a new quest. Apparently Hans, that zombie Mort keeps losing and finding again and has a true love for, has his own zombie wife and two zombie children. It infuriates the wife when Mort recruits Hans and he says, Come on, kick me, I deserve it. I can take it. I'm mostly sawdust and bird guano in the middle. Okay, just gonna add that to the list didn't show up on the genealogy test. Yep, Mort can certainly take that kick, immortal headass. Julian and Maurice are still trying to get back to stop Kodo, and now they've encountered Fusa, who they turn on each other. The Fusa use electric saws, laser beams, automotive accidents, atomic and nuclear bombs, plane crashes, and Godzilla to fight one another, none of which we see outside of Julian's reaction to it. Sage's mentor swaps the minds of Clover and Sage so Clover can use his body to save the kingdom. Turns out it was probably another paranormal lucid dream. Outside of the mind space, he's a floppy fish. The zombies suggest Mort gets his own army. Mort laughs evilly, transitioning us into chapter 9, in which Mort downs some coffee, permitting smart Mort to rip through and seize the assets of Mordecus Khan. During transformations like this one, Mort's body physically doubles for split seconds. I wonder if smart Mort is the original. He says, You don't know how much it hurts me to me here, I'm just too smart. The mom robot questionably sings him a song about how if you're smart in life, suppress it because the world loves stupid. This parallels exactly what I think Smart Mort did. Sort of like my theories on Patrick Starr, he defends himself with a stupid alter ego he gained. Perhaps. Again, could be either or, as Mort himself isn't fully stupid either. The song is basically a hardcore satire on the concept of it's okay to be you. Contextually, this show actually makes some sense, sadly. It's not all fast-paced slapstick at all. Julian nearly is killed by Fusa, but claims it is plot armor that keeps him alive, and he does a Matrix kick to perfection. Once Smart Mort enters Khan's universe, he disappears out of fear and leaves them all stranded amidst the army, and a furious Mordecus. Carl appears to save the day somehow, and Maurice is kidnapped, but everyone, you must know this. Chapter 10. Everything ever is explained. Holy hell is it ever. The show damn near ceases to be mysterious after this. I mean, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. But look at the time. I simply cannot edit all of this, and I've yet again tested my video lengths way too hard. I have limits, but again, I will edit the third and final section of part two ASAP. But again, honestly, as you'll see, at this point, it's just part three and four for algorithmic sake. <laughs> Subscribe. Do not miss anything. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at TheTheorizerYT, and until the very soon next time, I'm The Theorizer.